it's in you or it isn't. So it's a very clear uh, yes or no. Um, so um, whereas with EMS, we're dealing with a spectrum of disease. So it's not that one day the horse suddenly gets EMS um, and they didn't have it yesterday. Whereas with an infectious disease, it can be like that. With EMS, it's a gradual onset. It's, it's a very much a spectrum of disease. And that makes it a bit harder to um, firstly diagnose definitively and a bit harder to interpret diagnostic tests in some ways. And so when we get a diagnostic test for um, EMS and we tend to measure insulin, it's very, as a owner of a horse, or if, if you have a diagnostic test yourself, you want a yes or no answer, don't you? But in truth, it's often that we're talking about a spectrum of disease. And so we'll say you're, the insulin was very, very low. So there's a really low chance of EMS or the insulin was very, very high. So there's a very high chance of EMS, but quite often it's in the middle. So we'll say, OK, well, uh, you know, it's, it's not really high, but at the same time, you're probably at slightly increased risk of laminitis. And it's a, a, at the moment, it's a mild case of EMS. So, so it, it gets a little bit more complicated. I think the other thing that we know very well with um, coronavirus is that any diagnostic test can produce false positives and false negatives as well. So, and that's true for uh, EMS testing. Um, and then, like I said, di diagnostic tests for EMS put a horse on a spectrum. And it's, and it's a bit like cholesterol now. So increasingly, with human medicine, um, you don't get a yes or no answer. You get a percentage or they're able to, to, to put you into a category according to a test they might do. Um, so, um, and they might um, tell you that because your cholesterol or whatever they're testing is at this concentration, that means you have a certain percentage of having this condition. So, um, and that's what we'd like to achieve eventually with, with EMS. Um, so, EMS is a, um, when we're trying to diagnose EMS, it's really important that we think about what it actually is. Um, and it's a syndrome of high concentrations of insulin uh, along with insulin resistance. Um, that's in every case of EMS. It's a predisposition to laminitis. That's in every case of EMS. And then EMS also is made up of several other risk factors and consequences of those risk factors. So, so very commonly, horses with EMS are obese, but not every horse with EMS is obese, and not every obese horse has EMS either. Um, I think that's quite important to point out. And then the other thing to question here, and maybe something for discussion, is, is what, how do we quantify or how do we measure obesity? Um, we tend to uh, use body condition scoring, which is fat deposits on the outside of the horse, but actually... Um, just like with humans, probably the fat on the inside is, is, is very important. And then also certain, there's good fat and bad fat as well, if you like. So actually uh, the, the metabolic activity of fat is very variable um, and some fat is quite damaging. It has damaging metabolic consequences and other fat seems to be less damaging. Um, so obesity, just the, the, the amount of fat on the outside of the horse isn't necessarily the whole story. So when we measure, when we, the definitive way to diagnose EMS is by either if you see a horse which has laminitis and there's no other cause identified. So if you see a, a young horse with laminitis which doesn't have a uh, infectious disease or sepsis and it doesn't have increased weight bearing on one leg, then that horse has EMS. I think you can definitively say that. Um, if you see an older horse, then you have to decide whether that horse has PPID, EMS or possibly a combination of the two. Um, if you want to so say that's one way you can definitively diagnose EMS. The other way, and hopefully what we're trying to do is diagnose them before they have laminitis, is to measure insulin concentrations. And the best way to do this is to look at insulin response to a known amount of sugar or uh, that they eat. Um, and so this is uh, just an example. It's a sort of lots of wiggly lines on a graph. But this is just an example of this is the 12 ponies uh, I mentioned before. This is after they have a caro test with a relatively low amount of caro syrup, but it's, it's a known amount of sugar to every pony after a set amount of fasting. And you can see they all have di very different responses to that amount of sugar with their insulin. And so um, we have cutoffs for caro syrup test and we have a cutoff where at a certain level we consider that that much more likely to have EMS, whereas if they're below a certain level, we think it's less likely to have EMS. So this horse down at the bottom here with these crosses and the purple line, it's got a very low insulin response. And so 
very low risk of EMS, very low risk of laminitis or lower risk of laminitis, whereas these ones up here, that by high insulin responses, you can definitively say, yes, they have EMS and, um, and they're at higher risk of laminitis. These ones in the middle here, they're in a gray zone and you'd say, well, they've had a moderate response, but um, they're, not, they're not showing really bad uh, levels of insulin uh, to the caro syrup, but at the same time, they're not right down at the bottom here. So these are the horses that you might uh, implement some management, but or monitor them very carefully. Um, it's all very well talking about um, doing insulin responses to carrier syrup, but we can't test every horse, and um, it's not always possible to test horses for financial reasons or sometimes other reasons as well. So, um, and we can't go around a yard testing every single horse to see which one has EMS. So, how are we going to identify horses with EMS that are at increased risk of laminitis before it actually? Uh, happens. And this is where risk factors for conditions come in. And so this is where we uh, identify risk factors. And so by doing large st scale studies of horses uh, with EMS, we look for risk factors and then we can apply those to all horses in a population and decide whether there are increased risks for EMS. The best known risk factor for EMS certainly is obesity. Um, and um, and we know that the certainly in the UK, the, the a horse population is reasonably obese, um, it's fair to say. Um, so, um, and we test, assess obesity through body condition score, but also uh, crest fat as well. So crest neck score, um, the crest fat has a particular propensity to causing horses to have EMS and increased laminitis risk. Um, there are genetic predispositions to uh, EMS as well. And so we know some breeds are slightly more at risk and some breeds are at less risk. So, um, ten, Normally, the more hot-blooded breeds like thoroughbred and standard bred seem to be at lower risk of EMS, whereas the native pony breeds, uh, Morgan horses, um, they seem to be at higher risk of, of EMS. And that probably is how they've been bred over the years to be able to uh, live on more scrubby land. So a pony which is um, bred to survive on the Welsh hills has quite a different metabolic makeup compared to a, a thoroughbred. Um, other risk factors for EMS we've identified are horses which have at less active uses, so ones which have less exercise, older horses, those with laminitic rings on their feet, even if not, they've not actually had laminitis, and then those that have had laminitis in the last five years, which is fairly obvious. And then there are other blood tests that you can use, uh, which can help uh, identify horses where it's are increased risk for EMS, and probably one of the best known ones for that is adiponectin. And so by looking at these risk factors, if we look at a horse, our own horse, and we look at these risk factors, we can identify horses that maybe we want to do further testing. So we could go and do the carrier syrup test or maybe an intravenous test and get a definitive diagnosis um, and, and, and determine how at risk they really are. Um, but in some cases, actually, we make a presumptive diagnosis based on risk factors and start management. So maybe those cases where we are unable to do further testing will make a presumptive diagnosis. With EMS, the, the treatment is for EMS is predominantly exercise and diet related. And so we're prepared and we feel it's safe to make a presumptive diagnosis and start management because the management is not dangerous to the horse. Um, if, we, uh, if we happen to have made a, a false diagnosis and the horse didn't have EMS, actually, the worst that would happen is that it, we've, made, we've made diet changes and exercise changes. Now, those are quite... Uh, they can be quite stressful for the owner, they can be quite stressful for the horse. Um, but if we compare uh, to a condition such as colic, where our management might be doing surgery, then we have to be absolutely definitive that uh, we know the horse has a surgical lesion before we start that line of management. Uh, whereas I say with EMS management, it's less risk to the horse if we have a false diagnosis. But hopefully we don't have a false diagnosis if we, if we know what the risk factors are um, and um, we can identify these horses uh, accurately. Okay, so how do we manage it? Uh, this is a huge, huge topic. I could, as I say, we could talk for a long time about this. I've, I've whittled it down to one slide. I can't believe it. So really the goal is to reduce laminitis risk by reducing insulin concentration in the horse. And um, that's what we're aiming to do with EMS. Um, so, and the way we're doing that is firstly by feeding the lower sugar and starch feeds. So from day one, you feed low sugar and starch feeds and you'll get less insulin in your horse. Um, and then secondly, we're reducing the body's insulin response to those feeds over the longer term. And the main way that we're doing that is to um, 
increase the body's sensitivity to insulin. And so by methods such as fat loss and things like that, um, we can, and use of exercise, we will reduce the body's insulin response to those feeds. And uh, uh, you sound like a broken record, and I know GPs probably do as well um, when they're talking about this, but the main principles of EMS management are diet and exercise. And I think as vets, we, we are at fault often of um, giving very prescriptive uh, recommendations for both of those, which sometimes aren't actually practical and aren't, they're not possible to implement. Um, I think these need to be tailored according to the individual circumstances of the horse and also the individual circumstances of the owner. Um, and so it's, um, they can be challenging. And there are certainly horses, I can show you very, if anyone out there has horses which they've done everything right and they just cannot lose weight from their horses, um, we get we get weight loss resistance in horses quite commonly. And some horses, you take groups of horses, we've done it, we put them on exactly the same restrictive diets and some the weight drops off and others, they just refuse to lose weight. It's very, very challenging. And so, you know, we've got to, that's why it's so important to tailor these to the individual horse and also to, to, for vets to stay in touch um, and to um, monitor how things are going. Um, and those two, sometimes the management of EMS can be assisted by medication, possibly. The, the evidence for medication is still um, fairly uh, weak, um, but there's, there's enough that I think if you have diet and exercise uh, management that isn't working, then some medication can be useful. Good. So, well, that's that's in summary, and hopefully we'll have a discussion now. I've sort of lost sight of everyone here, but I can see the chat box and there's loads of questions coming in. So laminitis is not a disease on its own. It's a clinical sign of an underlying disease. I think that's really important to, to and that, that's something that's massively changed in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, probably. Um, you know, we, we recognise now that laminitis isn't a disease in its own right. Um, <clears throat> most cases of laminitis are associated with an underlying endocrine condition. Um, that's by far the majority of cases of laminitis that occur in the UK, certainly, and I would, I would say most countries around the world. Um, insulin is the direct link between those endocrine conditions, both P PPID and EMS um, and laminitis. And um, for EMS, we can use risk factors with or without extra diagnostic tests to identify horses with EMS and hopefully prevent laminitis happening. And management boils down mostly to diet and exercise, but it sometimes can be assisted with them um, with either nutraceuticals or, or, or medication as well. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry for the um, technical issues halfway through. I will um, I will bring up the chat box and hopefully awesome. you can, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Thanks very much, Harry. Um, Okay. I think Tamsin and I will take care of the questions for you so you don't have okay. to sort of worry too much about that and we'll kind of take turns in asking them so it'll be even more fun. Yeah I think the bad news <laughs> is that you're going to be here until midnight because there's a lot of good questions. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry sure about that. Uh, <laughs> don't yeah. worry I promise we won't keep you till midnight but there are a lot of very good questions so <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Dee do you want to go first? Yeah, so um, we had some good questions about crests, and I, and I know you mentioned in your talk, Harry, that they can sort of um, do different things to the body, especially that fat that collects along the crest. Um, so one question was, how much of a concern is a cresty neck, and what affects how hard or soft it is, and what may cause these changes? And then the second one was, how do you get rid of a crest? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So, so I think I think the crest gets blamed sometimes because it's the most visible. It's a very visible fat source, isn't it? And it's also the crest isn't. It's a combination of fat and also it's got collagen and connective tissue through it as well. So it's there's a big ligament through there, and so the um, so it's it that makes it very hard if you to actually lose crest fat. It's the hardest fat deposit to actually reduce in size, and it's also one of the most visible ones as well. So. Um, you can diet your horse, you can do great work dieting your horse, and the fat can be lost from inside the abdomen, but you don't really get any reward from that because you don't see it, but the horse is losing loads of fat, but it's just losing it from within the abdomen. So, so that's why sort of measuring the weight and things can be a very useful way to monitor weight loss. And if you're only using the crest, it can be a bit disheartening because actually you're doing a great job with your horse, but you're not seeing the weight falling off. Um, as far as the crest fat and its whether it's different. 
So in the same way, in, in people, they know that um, some abdominal fats are mental fat, I think, uh, that it acts slightly differently. And there have been studies where they take biopsies of fat from different deposits and look at how it actually acts. We, we always tend to think of fat as this inert energy store, but actually it's very um, active. Um, with It produces a lot of hormones um, and it has quite, and when it goes bad, if you like, it can be very pro-inflammatory. So it can cause a lot of inflammation through the body. It has quite a pro-inflammatory effect. And also it can have um, uh, effects on appetite. It can have effects on uh, insulin resistance as well. And so, um, and some studies have shown that crest fat acts slightly differently in those ways compared to other fat deposits in the horse. And so it might actually cause slightly more inflammatory change and it might cause more insulin resistance compared to other body fat deposits. But the Cresty Neck score was a score developed using uh, in the in the US actually um, well, a while ago now, and um, it's um, yeah the the Cresty Neck score has been shown to independently uh, correlate with um, with EMS as well. So it is quite a useful um, test just to feel the size of the crest. As far as losing weight from the crest, um, it's the same way of losing weight as you would from any fat source really, but it can be mu much, much harder to shift from the crest compared to other fat deposits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do they say it's kind of the, the last fat to go on and then also the last to go as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in severe cresting X, so there's cresting X score of five, which is where the crest actually has fallen over to one side. Um, that can even happen. And, and, and that's very hard to, to bring back if you like. Um, so, Dorothy says oh, she's very she's, much. Dorothy says she's googling for uh, liposuction for horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the crest to be challenging, though. I say, as I say, it's it's, uh, it's pretty solid. <laughs> but okay. I, he says never. I can assure you, I've never done liposuction on a horse. So I'm not sure why I'm saying it would be challenging, but I'm imagining it might be. <laughs> Uh, but you didn't think you'd be discussing that tonight. <laughs> no. um, okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions about whether EMS is considered to be reversible. Um, and if so, would it be like entirely reversible for the horse's life? Or would you encourage people to keep testing as they, you know, go through the horse's life? Or um, It is most definitely reversible. Yes. Okay. Um, and and it's, um, it is easier to reverse in some horses than others, for mm. sure. Um, but um, we've got plenty of horses where they've had recurrent laminitis um, and they're very uh, insulin resistant. So mm -hmm. they have EMS, profound EMS. Um, and through diet and management and things, the, the, the measures of insulin come down and the insulin and the laminitis stops. There are plenty of horses that happens to. Um, I think the, there are, however, some genetic risk factors for EMS, and obviously you can't change your genes. Um, and so um, some horses will always be at higher risk of getting EMS. Mm -hmm. And so horses which are a high risk of EMS, and, and the, typically that would be, as I say, the native UK pony breeds um, in, in the UK. Um, you need to just be more careful with their body weight. You need to be more careful with what you feed them. Whereas most owners of thoroughbreds, um, they're desperately trying to put weight on um, and EMS isn't a major consideration so yeah it varies according to, to what type of horse you're talking about. Okay thank you. Cool so we've had also a number of questions about um, testing for um, EMS or insulin dysregulation and we know sort of with humans we, we can have the rapid diagnostic uh, or the rapid tests for diabetes where you can check your your sugar levels and so on and do you think that that might be a possibility that could be available to horses and um, that you might be able to do these rapid insulin or, or glucose tests? The, I don't think there's a so with a lot of um all sorts of blood tests we do stool, you know we call them stool side of point of care tests glucose you can do a point of care test very easily but glucose glucose is different in horses and people so with with so people get metabolic syndrome as well and it's and it's very similar in many ways to equine metabolic syndrome that the, the sort of major difference really is is what happens after a while which is in people the the pancreas's ability to produce insulin starts to get exhausted so the pancreas doesn't keep up with insulin production and so they start to get 
high, le high levels of glucose in the blood. That doesn't happen with horses. With horses, the pancreas can just carry on pumping out insulin as long as it wants in high, high concentrations. And so in horses, we don't normally see high levels of glucose. So it's very unusual, for example, to see urine, um, high levels of urinary glucose, even blood glucose in, in EMS horses. Um, so I don't, glucose isn't a particularly useful test for EMS, unfortunately. Um, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, a sort of uh, instant test for insulin, but it's a, it's a, you, so it is a blood test and you do need to, your vet to come out um, and take a blood test and send it off to a lab. Um, so, but the, the, as I say, an instant test for EMS, if you like, is, is looking at the risk factors. So um, does my horse have uh, enlarged and divergent hoof rings? Is it overweight? And is it, is it a breed which is at high risk? Um, does, it, does it have a very sedentary main activity? And if, if it ticks all those boxes, then, then it's at higher risk. So that instantly tells you that it's slightly higher risk for EMS. Yeah. Cool. Um, I've got one that's just come in, so it's jumping the queue, but I just think it's such a good question that I'm interested in your reply. Um, is there a difference between EMS and type two diabetes in people? Uh, yes, there is. Um, so type two diabetes, um, they start that there's the, the fundamental background to it is there's a lot of similarities. Mm. Um, so it starts normally with insulin resistance. Um, obesity is a major risk factor. Um, but type two diabetes, um, as I say, that it starts it, it pre diabetes before type two diabetes happens, there's, there's metabolic syndrome, um, which is very similar to equine metabolic syndrome, but in people, um, humans can't uh, the, the pancreas loses the ability to pump out large amounts of insulin yeah. and so actually people with type 2 diabetes eventually become have low levels of insulin mm -hmm. um, whereas horses the, the pancreas just continues to pump, pump out insulin in high concentrations oh that's really so, interesting so there is something different about the equine and the mm -hmm. human pancreas mm, yeah. okay. well, we don't get laminitis I guess <laughs> making it easier to <laughs> No, uh, that's, that's another, actually, that's a, I mean, that's the effect of high levels of insulin is different between, and also the, the you know, the, the, the obesity causes mm -hmm. in humans, um, it causes um, vessel wall damage. So we get things like aneurysms, um, in, increased risk of blood clots, heart attacks, things like that. Whereas in horses, it does cause it slightly increased blood pressure, but it doesn't, we don't see heart attacks or strokes or anything like that as a consequence mm -hmm. of metabolic syndrome, whereas you do in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Cool. We've had a question about um, a dipinectin testing, and is this something that can sort of be done on its own, and or would you rather do it in conjunction with sort of dynamic insulin testing or or basal insulin? Um, and what would sort of the normal levels of that be? The adiponectin. Yeah, so adiponectin is a bit different. To, so most things like insulin, glucose, everything like that, more is bad, less is good. Whereas adiponectin is the other way around. Adiponectin is a good hormone, if you like. So, so if we have low levels of adiponectin, we get worried. Um, so, um, and it's a hormone produced by fat, and it's produced by good fat, if you like. So it's you know, and it has, and the reason it's good is that it, it increases the cell's sensitivity to insulin. So um, the, its use as a diagnostic test is controversial, it's fair to say. Um, part of the reason is that you can test for adiponectin in many different ways. There's lots of different forms that circulate around the body and then there's multiple different tests. There are different you know, designs of tests and they, and they don't agree very well, unfortunately. It gets very complicated. Um, I think the best way to regard adiponectin is as a risk factor for EMS. So in the same way as you might look at a horse which is obese or a horse which is a certain breed um, as a high risk as an increased risk factor and again low adiponectin would be a increased fixed risk factor um, to definitively diagnose EMS it has to be insulin in my opinion in insulin is the absolute key for diagnosing EMS and so I'd, I would always trust an insulin result over an adiponectin result. Um, adiponectin is is quite a good measure of um, body fat in the horse as well and also obesity so and again, as as so, it's, it can can be used to monitor weight loss as well. Thank you. Okay. Oh, really interesting. Um, okay, we've had quite a few questions about um, supplements, and <clears throat> so 
um, whether there are any supplements that would support a horse that was prone to developing, I don't know, like maybe like quite a heavy native breed, for example, um, and also whether if a horse already has EMS, whether there are any supplements that you would consider would be particularly useful or are they all just marketing? Any thoughts on that? Uh, there's a lot of marketing with supplements, it's fair <laughs> to say. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there are some there are some there are some reasonable supplements out there as well for horses. Um, you've always got to be careful with a talk like this. You don't know who's in the audience, but yeah. the, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, yes. I think there is a lot of marketing. I guess if if you we always try and be evidence based with our recommendations in veterinary medicine as much as possible. And so for us to recommend something, we really want to know that there's evidence that it works. Um, that's a uh, good evidence. Um, that's all very well, but the problem is, is that there's a lack of scientific studies out there for some things like supplements. And so, so you could be waiting for a hundred years to, to gather enough evidence to determine whether something works or not. The main ones that are, so there's a few, there are lots of supplements actually that have been sort of promoted for EMS. Chromium has been, is one, um, um, uh, the uh, fructoligosaccharide, so sort of short sugar chain mm -hmm. um, supplements have been recommended. Um, the best I can say for those is that there's mixed evidence. Uh, we don't know whether they work or not. The answer, I'm afraid, is probably not. Um, yeah. Was there a particular supplement that someone was asking about? Or um, uh, Not especially. They were asking in general. Someone has specifically mentioned cinnamon, um, and I know there's often questions about magnesium use um, specifically rather than yeah, I know they're not marketed supplements, but um, do you have any opinions on those? Um, those yeah, I, I don't, I'm not aware, unless there's something recently that I haven't seen, I'm not aware that magnesium's got any evidence to support its use in EMS, unfortunately, I, w I wish it did. Yeah. Um, magnesium, head shaking it does, uh, it does have effects in the, you know, clearly it has effects in the body, mm -hmm. uh, there's evidence for hearts and, and head shaking, but I'm not aware of good evidence for, for EMS, but um, if there's a, if there's a, good study that I'm unaware of, please do send it to me. Um, <laughs> cinnamon, I haven't heard of anything that recommended that. Okay. I would say probably not. Uh, I, it's it's awfully simple, but really it's 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 low, feeding low, not what we call non-structural carbohydrate feeds, so low sugar, low starch feeds. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Okay. Good. And I think we've had sort of two questions about, do you know if there is a link between EMS and uh, PSSM, so polysaccharide storage myopathy? Um, so normally, so PSSM, they tend to be quite insulin sensitive. So, um, and so they, they don't tend to go together. Um, no, um, so, um, so I'm not aware that there is a sort of genetic link between the two, no. Yeah, I think the only thing that I know of is that the management is sort of, mm. they recommend with PSSM horses also low starch, wow. low sugar diets. Yes, um, yeah. yeah, so you're trying, yeah, uh, yes, you're trying to give low sugar diets and, and higher fat diets because the, so the muscle cells use fat as their predominant energy, energy source because they're unable to store and utilize uh, uh, carbohydrates properly. So um, yeah, so there are some similarities. Um, regular exercise as well, you know, the, the, the worst thing is possible, possible to do for a PSSM animal is to, uh, is to rest it and then, uh, and then exercise them. Um, so regular exercise is important. Um, and that's very true for EMS as well. So um, yeah, so there's some similarities there. Oh, brilliant. Okay, um, we've got a couple. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Did you have? Did you want to say more on PSSM? No, no, no. That's all right. No. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay. Um, we've got a couple about management in terms of managing quality of life. While so, if you've got um, say a severely insulin resistant horse at, at the moment, or they're on a you know one one point five percent diet at the moment, um, how you weigh up giving that horse good quality of life now and also in future and managing its EMS um, and do you have do you have particular thoughts on that? So weighing up quality of life for a horse? Did yeah you so um, so like for example if you have to diet a lot and you can't give um, very much forage for example um, and you know you have to you know worry about I don't know ulcers having to use small hold hay nets that sort of thing um, 
are there are there things that you've seen that kind of would uh, give a horse good quality of life even though you're having to diet it in a you know quite a strict way um you know or do you have any tips i guess for owners in that sort of situation yeah i think that's a very very relevant question because often we're 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 um implementing these diets um and they are difficult for the horse and they're difficult for the owner and the and we're restricting feed intake and for a horse one, clearly one of the major pleasures in life is eating mm. um, and so we're, we're taking that away from the horse and then sometimes we're also shutting them in a stable we're removing them from other horses mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important we we consider the sort of quality of life for the horse um, in addition to that they sometimes they often have laminitis too so that you know they've got sore feet mm. um, I suppose um, as, and on top of that as well we're, I'm talking about EMS often in isolation but actually uh, a lot of horses especially when they get older they've got other things going on so you know they might have asthma so they don't want to be shut in a stable all day um, you quite rightly mentioned gastric ulceration risk so you, you know we know that for a lot of um, conditions um, regular so trickle feeding little and often feed and not long periods of no feed is best and that's particularly true mm -hmm. for ulcers so I think it's challenging I think there's um, quite a lot of systems, actually, Tamsin, you'd be much better positioned to talk to, about this than me, but um, obviously there are quite a lot of systems where you're able to um, uh, implement dietary restriction to a horse, but allow them to go outside. So um, whether that's, and that's going to vary hugely according to what facilities a person has, but um, whether that's a, a sand yard or track system or something else, if there's any way that horses can go outside, interact with other horses, um, that I think is probably um, a great way to improve their welfare rather than having to keep them in a stable. Mm. Um, that's very challenging in winter. In winter, you, you know, that's, that's all, often almost impossible uh, unless you're very lucky. Um, there are lots of other uh, environmental enrichments that can be done. So the best way to environmentally enrich a horse is to offer it feed. Um, and so anything that can slow the consumption of feed down is uh, optimal uh, small hold hay nets hanging in the middle of the stable little and often um, uh, are, is great uh, other environmental enrichments like other horses that they can see mirrors feed balls things like that um, will help as well okay. but Tamsin you'll have some great um, tips on that and Dee you'll both have some you'll have many more of those at your fingertips than I will yeah thank you um, yeah just if anyone's interested in that kind of thing um, we um, we have had um, a talk before where Dee gave a really good example of a track system that they put in place at the AHT. Sorry, I should just let you say that, <laughs> um, but that worked really well. Um, for, oh, for no, some... no, go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and um, we've also talked before about different types of enrichment that people can, can do and so on. Um, and we will tomorrow be releasing a report about different grazing systems that people um have used for example track systems but also things like woodland turnout and so on and um, where you have low grass environments that are also kind of highly enriched for horses um which is very exciting but um actually do you mind if i just jump on the back of that question with another related one sorry to don't want to hog the time but um mm -hmm. so people often um people often when i'm talking to this with, about this with people they are often concerned about um stress the horse being being stressed um, by its management by a restricted environment and that causing um, resistance to weight loss um, and therefore a lot of people prefer to feed ad lib to their horses and feel that their horses will learn to self-regulate and I just wondered if you had any um, particular thoughts about whether that's a valid concern about stress and horses then holding on to their weight um, and also about feeding ad lib and whether that's something you would ever do with an EMS horse or or uh, clinical research around self-regulation. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, quantifying and assessing animal stress is so difficult. Um, but um, I, th I think if you, if you are, when you're really restricting a horse's diet, I think it's fair to say that sometimes it will be stressful for the horse. Mm -hmm. but it's very difficult. I think certainly the it's easiest to diet a horse and restrict a horse. And if you like, if you if you're assuming that it does cause some stress, it's easiest to do once you've seen once the horse has had laminitis, because you see how utterly stressful laminitis is. Uh, and I think that outweighs all levels of other stress, really. Um, it's like people, if you want someone to diet and exercise, um, once they've had some kind of coronary event, um, they're much more willing to do it than, than as a preventative. So it's um, once you've seen the horse with laminitis, I guess it's, it's, it's easier. But at the same time, 
anything that we can do to reduce any stress associated with um, dieting and restrictive diets, the better. Um, some horses do have, some horses are innate, innately uh, insulin sensitive and don't tend to put on fat and other horses are innately uh, insulin resistant and will put on fat. Mm -hmm. And I think how able you are to give horses ad lib diets very depends on the individual horse and it'll vary hugely. Mm -hmm. If a horse has got tendency to EMS, I would not give it ad lib feed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's plenty of studies, particularly ponies, they can they can uh, eat huge amounts of feed way over their requirements um, when they give an ad lib feed, particularly in sugary pastures and things like that. So ponies are really designed, you know, the Welsh pony was bred and it's metabolically set up to put on weight in the summer when the, the grass is good and then lose weight in the winter when the, the grass is sparse on the Welsh hillsides. And, um, and so they're, you know, they're, they're genetically made up, if you like, to go become really quite thin over the winter. And then because they're quite thin when they go into spring, they can use this seasonal weight gain um, to lay down fat stores, which are then used up in the winter. The difference with the way do we domesticate horses is we tend to give them summer type feeds all year round. And so we don't get that seasonal weight loss. And I think that's a that's a crucial issue with, you know, there's often not a way around it, if you like, but that's part of the, the problem that we have is that um, we don't see that seasonal weight loss in, in our horses. And so they tend to just go up and up and up with their weight. Yeah. Does that answer the question? I, 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 yeah, no, definitely. That's such, else to, yeah, it's yeah. such a good point. It's a, it's a really hard one, isn't it? I can t totally sympathise with owners wanting to feed ad-lib, but um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear. So can I, I you know, yeah. the horse will kick, I know they kick the stable yeah. door and, you know, it's very <laughs> difficult. Mm. Um, it's, um, it yeah. is challenging. Yeah. Definitely. Um, okay, sorry, Dee, I jumped on the back there. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Um, so we've had a couple of questions as well about, obviously, we want to change diet and exercise our horses to help reverse EMS or control those insulin levels. Um, but what, what, what can we do when we have, for example, a horse that is acutely laminitic and then exercise isn't an option? Or perhaps we might have horses with arthritis and things like that, which might, you know, prevent them being exercised as much. Yeah. So there's, there was a recent study, actually, which showed that an even small amount of exercise is beneficial. So um, I can't remember exactly how much it was, but it was relatively light exercise. It was about 20 minutes regular exercise, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was like from that, yeah. the Bamford study. So um, whereas... Previously, there was a, a opinion. I think it's true that the more exercise you do, the better the effect. And it's exercise has been shown to improve your insulin sensitivity independent of diet. So um, exercise is, is great for, for EMS. Um, like you say, often we, we, we aren't able to diagnose EMS until the horse has had laminitis or they've got sore feet. Or as I say, we, they might have arthritis or some other condition which means that they can't exercise i think um doing as much as exercise as is possible within the confines of your horse's other conditions and with laminitis you certainly need to be cautious not to um not to traumatize the feet too early um uh, and with arthritis obviously often with arthritis some exercise is very good actually but um you don't want to overdo it so i think it's this case of as much exercise as you can do um, if your horse is well and able to be ridden and stuff, the, the more exercise, the better, really. So, Yeah. And I think probably just off the back of that, um, a few people have asked, but this, I'm guessing you'll say it's very much down to sort of the individual horse and working with your vet, but kind of asking, you know, when a horse is recovered from a laminitis, you know, when can you start to exercise and kind of how do you assess whether they're comfortable to carry on and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I would... Um... There's obviously cost implications involved with involving your vet and with taking x-rays, but I think things like um, x-rays can be quite useful. The severity of the original um, episode of laminitis, um, the hoof shape involving a farrier too can be useful, I think. Um, so I, I don't think there's a single rule that you can apply, really. X-rays can be useful. Mm. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, we've had a couple of questions about the cold, um, and um, I know there's there's been sort of a slight change in owner perceptions around laminitis this 
this year that I've seen um, a little bit from earlier than that, but um, around whether the cold weather itself can cause laminitis, so from the horse having cold legs, for example, um, or uh, and, and whether that's a thing, um, and if so, what can you do about that? Um, and if not, are there other reasons that horses might be more likely to get laminitis in winter, which we know is, is quite common now based on Dean's research? Um, I think the interestingly, if you if you have a horse with a laminitis, mm -hmm. EMS laminitis, mm -hmm. um, one way to stop the laminitis getting worse or to prevent it getting worse is to to put their feet into suspend their feet in ice flurry. So, um, so it's to make their feet really really cold. So um, I don't think that I think part part of the reason that maybe this I think correct me if there's something else going on, but I think it's probably the theories come from either the fact that if the feet are cold you get vasoconstriction so you get constriction of the vessels and that might mm. cause a laminitis and then the other thing is possibility of eating frosty grass it's digested differently and therefore mm. it uh, has a sort of different insulin response i don't think that either of those two things are likely to be involved in in right. laminitis occurring in the winter mm -hmm. most laminitis occurs because of dietary changes i think often yeah. horses are going into the winter um, if they've had a very plentiful diet through the summer uh, they might be in fairly good body condition. They're not ridden as much maybe, so they're doing less exercise. And then sometimes they're brought in um, stables, fed ad-lib feed and maybe a bit more feed. And so, so that might tip them over into laminitis. I think that's probably the most likely underlying reason for, for any right. winter surges in laminitis that people might see. Oh, that's interesting. So it's the kind of the, change, the management changes that would happen at the same time rather than the cold itself. I think that would be the most likely thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that's interesting. I and see the I, I can see the rationale for the yeah. sort of thought that the cold on the feet or something like that, or possibly the change in the grass. Okay. It's, um, I, I don't think either of those are going to be there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, thank you. And um, and then in terms of frosty grass, so similar thing. Um, is frosty grass a particular concern for a horse that's got EMS, even if it's not got laminitis at the moment? I'm not aware that the frosty grass would cause. The only reason it might cause issues would be if it was unable to be digested and absorbed in the small intestine or possibly if it changes its uh, nutritional makeup. But um, I'm not aware that it's going to significantly alter the insulin response. So I don't, I don't think it is a major okay. issue for the, for the oh, EMS horses. OK, thank you. Cool. Um, how are you doing for time, Harry? Because I know mm -hmm. we've sort of been on for I'm about, good, I'm all right. uh, yeah. 15 minutes. You're still okay to answer a couple more questions. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. we've still got quite a few. Yeah. Um, so we had one quite interesting question. You, you showed us really nice pictures of, of sort of what the inside of the horse's foot looks like. Um, and somebody asked, so when we have that detachment of the lamina or lamella and the, the movement of the pedal bone, how does then that reattach again? How do we fix that right. connection on the inside? Yeah, that's a that the, so you get a, a laminar wedge. So you get a, a sort of triangle of necrotic of dead tissue that is there where the where the laminae were and where the hoof was joined to the bone. You get this separated, which is blood and um, broken down laminae, really. So that eventually comes back because you have the hoof growing down from the coronary band in a more normal orientation. So so the the hoof grows from the coronary band downwards, and it if with corrective shoeing and or, or with corrective trimming or shoeing whichever way it's being done um you you've got to wait for the hoof to grow back down the the bone isn't going to pick itself back up if you see what i mean attached to reattach to the laminae unfortunately you've got to wait for the new dorsal hoof wall to grow down yeah and i guess that's why also why some the recovery from some very serious laminitis episodes just takes so long because you're you're waiting for that that hoof to grow back down and 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 the sort of the good lamina to to be there again yes yes absolutely it can be a long process a horse getting over laminitis so mm. um, yeah cool mm. thank you um okay uh, we've had a couple of questions about hay as always <laughs> um so there were a couple of questions about your graphs, which are so interesting of those ponies and their different responses to the, um, to the same forage. Um, but, and then we've got quite a few hay questions, so I'm, I'm trying to work out the best way about <laughs> kind of summarizing them. Um, there've been some around, so if, so those 
the graphs of the insulin response that went like that. Um, and you had one that was like, one was hay and one was haylage. Is there a reason, the question is, is there a reason that that's different between hay and haylage? Or if you had lower sugar haylage, would it mimic the hay? So could, would it be okay to feed lower sugar haylage basically? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so haylage is obviously quite different. It's a f fermented grass, if you like, and it's got um, different uh, nutritional composition to hay. Um, the, the, those three forages we showed you there, the haylage had a higher sugar, so you would expect it to have a higher insulin response, but it, it was particularly high, the insulin response actually to the haylage, right. um, even considering the sugar content. Mm -hmm. And so we we're quite interested to know whether or not the fermentation products that are in haylage actually cause a higher insulin response in the horse compared to maybe products in dried preserved haze. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was the that we published that paper a couple of years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the hay and the soaked hay um, curves, you could see how much lower the insulin response was to soaked hay. Um, they were exactly the same batch of hay which just one was soaked for 12 hours and and yeah. and it leaches sugars out and so you do get a lower response i know soaking hay at particularly this time of year is a complete pain in the neck <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it does reduce the insulin response mm -hmm. um so it's worth doing mm -hmm. hays are difficult because they vary hugely in sugar content and it's very difficult just by looking at a hay externally to know what the sugar content of a hay is um, you can get analysis done and it doesn't have to be that expensive. So feed companies, some feed companies offer it. You do have to sample your hay batch properly, though, um, and you can't just sort of take the nearest handful of hay and send it off. You need to mm -hmm. do a proper sampling technique where you take a representative sample of hay. But it, mm -hmm. it can be useful to to measure the amount of sugar in your hay. And if you find the if you find the sugar contents really low, then you could feed it with more confidence where if you found the sugar content is really high then you probably need to soak it mm -hmm. okay that's interesting and um the age-old question um you mentioned 12 mm -hmm. hours there <laughs> how long should you soak oh, it okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry have yeah, to ask but, sorry. that's okay so yeah there'll be lots of lots of studies where people soak hay for lots of different amounts of time and, <laughs> and sort of uh you know whether or not it's uh, i think 12 hours is a it's um it's 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 I think it's reasonably convenient to do it overnight. Mm. Uh, and although some studies showed that shorter soaking times work just as well, mm. there are others that showed that you do need a longer soaking time. So I think if you're able to soak it for 12 hours, that's good. And um, the time, the conditions that you can't do it, I, I saw we had some international visitors, but uh, if you live somewhere like Florida, if you try and soak hay for 12 hours, you have a <laughs> fetid hay soup by the end of 12 hours. So if you live in very warm climates, then soaking for 12 hours is impractical. But um, in most British conditions, soaking for 12 hours is fine. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I see we, we do have Claire McLeod, the nutritionist here, who has, who has previously said the same, but also to people who are concerned about that, to, that it's a good idea if you soak it for the amount of time that's convenient for you. And if it's not working, just then soak for longer, basically, which is, it's, always, it's really nice to hear you both say, you know, <laughs> go with what's practical for you and then and then kind of work, work yeah. there, really. I guess that's the, we all have to work around our own lives as well. Don't we so, yeah. we do. Yeah. Life goes on. Even with horses, life goes on, doesn't it? The, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, um, I think one thing that's true about soaking hay it also leaches other nutrients as well. So uh, quite a lot of minerals, vitamins, things like that. And then preserved forage like hay is quite low in vitamin E, for example. So so we'd always recommend feeding a low calorie balance there as well as um, soaking. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, because okay. we can always sort of add those nutrients back in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Um, right, so we've had one question just quickly going back to hoof growth. Oh, sorry, Tamsin, did you want no, to carry on with- No, 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 you go, sorry. Soaking hay questions. No, no, I'm done, you go. <laughs> Uh, we just had a quick question on on how long it takes the, the hoof to replace itself to sort of grow out yeah so it varies hugely but sort of about there's about six months of growth in a horse's foot so um so that that would be but i mean if often often the, the, the we're dressing the foot and adjusting the shape often it will be dressed back at the toe um to to alter the, the biomechanics within the hoof um and you'll start to you'll start to get um reasonable hoof growth you'll see a more normally aligned uh, hoof at the top after a, sort of two or three months okay 
Brilliant. Okay, thank you. It feels you. like a very long time when you're waiting on your own horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, should we just do maybe one more question each and then let poor Harry go? <laughs> this yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, we've had quite a few questions about exercising um, horses that have previously been laminitic. Um, and when you know, uh, when you know how, how safe it is to exercise. So um, I know previously you said about x-rays and so on, but um, is, is there kind of a rule of thumb for like how long people should take before they start walking their horses, how long they take trotting, that sort of thing? Is there anything like that? Or is it literally just down to the individual? It's, it, it's really so hard to say because you get you get some laminitis where you don't have movement of the pedal bone of the bone within the hoof. Okay. And and on the whole, um, they are going to recover quicker. On the this is a very much on the whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and then others where the bone does move within the hoof and that destabilizes the foot more and and also the the pedal the tip of the pedal bone rotates and sinks within the hoof so it's much closer to the soul and then also it starts to crush the so it, it squeezes the soul between the ground and the tip of the foot so yeah. so that's also quite painful mm -hmm. um so in that situation they're normally not as able to go back to work as quickly mm -hmm. um so a combination of looking at whether or not the the, the, the bone is moved within the foot mm -hmm. and the degree of movement of the bone within the foot um i think the 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 initial lameness of the horse so if the, the horse was only very mildly lame and mm -hmm. and there's no movement of the foot then they'll go back to work much more quickly mm -hmm. i think it's fair to say even even after a horse is looking completely sound and you know ha no longer have signs of inflammation in the foot they'll still need uh, mm -hmm. probably a month at least uh, to allow the foot completely settle okay. back in after a severe episode of laminitis mm -hmm. okay brilliant thank you D, last one. Oh. Um, <laughs> this is, I, th I thought, quite a good one. So, so, and someone's asked, is there an online resource where regular owners can find scientific studies on different equine topics? Um, so I would say sort of follow our Facebook group. Yeah. Um, that would be and, the number one place. Yeah, yeah and, our, <laughs> and our webinars um, yeah. with great people I, like Harry. Yeah. Um, but think, do you, do you think, think of any? Yeah, um, I think your Facebook group has yeah i mean it's you both i guess it's rely you've got evidence-based uh information up there so i think the information you put up there you uh, you're not commercial you don't have a commercial reason to do anything either i think i think some of the commercially led ones sometimes are plugging a product which makes it difficult um whereas yeah i think the facebook group does a great job i think there are some other sites um there's some other laminitis specific sites which summarize the literature quite nicely actually some of the websites your horse um has some quite good articles on it actually um so does horse and hound often they're they're quite well written uh, on the whole i'm talking about the the actual articles not the for uh, the forum i wouldn't be so necessarily you know there's some good stuff on there but at the same time there's there's um some stuff which i wouldn't trust as much but um it a lot of the publications are um you have to have subscriptions to journals to get to them. That's the problem. So the veterinary papers, scientific papers, which are written, but there are some open access ones. So we try and publish as much of ours as possible open access. Mm -hmm. So I'll put a link to our, we did a, we just published a, a large study where we examined 350 ponies around the Northwest. Uh, we looked for risk factors for equine metabolic syndrome. We assessed how, um, yeah, their body weight, um, things like that. So, um, well, certainly I could put a link to that on your Facebook group. Um, yeah. So some some scientific studies are open access, yeah, um, but they can be hard reading sometimes. That's yeah, yeah, that's that's <laughs> what I was going to say. If you could maybe do like a little uh, I'll do a summary, summary yeah, yeah. for us and then will, the link, yeah. that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, well, because I think it's um, yes, it's it's sort of dark. some of the stuff that's published is you know that it's some very he heavy weight sort of what molecules go where within the cell and where the things it's just not very readable but I, I think some of the studies like your one d uh, and obviously terms in your studies as well are, are much more readable and much more useful <laughs> so yeah i can summarize the um the one we just did that's fine Cool. Awesome. And Thank just, you. And just to say for everybody um, on our pages, so we, we would only really share information that's um, based on scientific evidence, really, unless it's like little anecdotes about our horses, which we sometimes do share. But, uh, you know, we, we don't share things that are just kind of based on our opinion. So it would always be um, anything we share is evidence based. And if you're um, if you're not sure about an issue like 
for example, the soaking hay issue, then feel free to ask us and we can put a post um, showing to our knowledge what the best um the best evidence that we have um is around that and people do quite often email us with things like that or or pictures yeah. of their horses which we also love so <laughs> please feel free <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think there's um there's a couple of uh sort of journalist sites as well that do quite a good job of summarizing research so uh, the horse.com yeah um, they're quite good and i think the other yes one is that's the Amer new... that's the american website too, yes isn't it? And yes, then there's yeah, a New yeah. Zealand one, horse, is it Horse Talk? Yep. Yes, yes. So we, we've, I've been contacted by both of those for a summary of the paper. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, well, then yeah, we could yeah. just, just share, share that then. That might save you oh, some work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes, the, yeah, the, the, the horse.com is the American one, isn't it? I think yeah. they have some good, mm. um, good um, information. Very readable. Yeah. They tend to summarise recent scientific reports. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, we've got some really lovely feedback. Lots of people saying that they now feel a lot more confident about managing their horses. So thank you very much. Really appreciate you giving up your evening. We've had 200 people pretty much the whole way through, which is amazing. So thank you so much. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm grateful to people for, for coming along and uh, listening. So I hope it's, I hope it's useful. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it is a tough one. I think having a horse, if, if you have a horse with EMS and I guess a lot of you do, if you're, on this site then uh, or come tonight then that's uh, that's um i think it's a tough thing to to deal with but um yeah you can get them better i think that's a nice thing about ems it, it is reversible you can make a massive difference um through your management so yeah. hang in there that's great thank you that's such a reassuring message and a nice way to end <laughs> yes, definitely. thank you very much and thanks everyone i'm sorry we didn't get to answer all the questions but i think we got through most of them yeah okay well thank you so much everyone have a nice evening um and yeah hope to see you soon at the next time <laughs> thank you again harry all right bye 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 bye, bye.